Wonderful. That was great. Let's give them another round of applause. Good job, boys and girls. Praise the Lord. That was good. Well, it's our turn to sing, so let's all grab a hymn book and let's stand together. And we'll turn to hymn number 219. We'll sing Little as Much When God is in It. Aren't you glad for that today? Let's sing it out on that first verse. In the harvest field, our high man, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the heart. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and He'll not forget His own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown. fourth verse. When the cup the dear is ended and our hanks on earth is run, he will say if we are faithful, welcome home, my child well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. Amen. You may be seated. Pray for the choir as we sing.
Amen. Every time I have an answered prayer, he amazes me, amazes me more and more. Well, let's all stand and we'll sing hymn number 507. If you need a hymn book, hymn number 507, we'll sing, Come Thou Found. Let's sing it out to the Lord. Let's sing it out on the first verse. There, if you need a hymn book, hymn number 507. singing as the choir comes down and join you turn around and greet one another let them know you're glad to see them tonight and then we'll come back and sing that last verse again first all together again. Thank you for being here this evening. So good to see you on this Wednesday night. And I've enjoyed the choir and the kids singing. That was great. Thank the Lord for it. And uh, well, I'm glad we have something to sing about. Amen. And whatever you've been through today, I don't know what it is. But I'm sure many of you, how many of you had a rough day? Just said, you don't be bad, just rough. Rough? All right. We got four truthful people and a whole bunch of liars. No, geez. I always say that. I call you liars all the time. That's not good. Um, you know, you've had a rough, I don't care what kind of day you've had. Man, he is so good. I'm telling you, sometimes you just got to fight through the rubbish and all the stuff to see how good he is. I mean, you're going down the road and Satan's throwing darts at you faster. You can duck and move and jive. You're just trying to duck and move and get out of the way. And through all of that, if you look long enough, Boy, you'll see gems of God's goodness 
everywhere, everywhere. He's littered them all over your life and you'll see them. May God help us to do that. And I'm glad we can come here tonight and worship the Lord. Put aside whatever's on your mind, on your heart. You're tired, give that to him. You're worried about something tomorrow, give that to him. Trying to figure out where you're going to eat after service, give that to him. All of it. Uh, just lay it down and let's worship for a little while. Let's bow for a word of prayer for the offering. Thank you again for being here. So good to see you. And Isaac, you lead us in prayer, please. Uh, Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be uh, back in your house, Lord. I pray that we'll um, come with an empty mind or broken heart uh, to come and worship you, Lord. And I just want to give you all the honor, glory, and praise that, that you rightfully deserve for everything you've done and all you're going to do, Lord. And I pray you'll just uh, please uh, be the service, Lord, and bless the offering, bless the gift and you give her. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Appreciate that. And if you have your Bibles uh, tonight, Matthew chapter number six, Matthew chapter number six, and uh, I want you to open up to verse 33 and very familiar passages of scripture, Matthew six, verses 33. And you know, there are so many theories as to what you can do in regards to, to worry fretting. So many theories, there are so many ideas, and, and you know that, that anxiety, and we live in an anxious society. I don't know that we have been in a more anxious society ever in the history of our culture. Um, everybody is anxious. And you know, as you get to thinking about it, we have more things tonight than we've ever had. Probably we have less to be anxious about than any other generation. I'm like during the depression, I know you don't want to hear it. You, you picture your dad saying, well, pastor, I, when I was, you know, I heard him tell all the tales. He walked five miles down, uphill, you know, in the snow, go to school without shoes and all that. But, you know, you honestly, if you look at it, when you're, when you're wondering how you're going to eat, and you're trying to build a rabbit gum to catch a rabbit for your family to eat. Um, you got a little, I mean, you, you got to get busy. You think about most of us, you didn't have to think how you're going to eat today. What you're going to eat, oh yeah. Not how. Because it just comes. So when you think about it, we really don't have anything to be anxious over. But we do a whole lot of it. A whole lot of it. Anxiety, and I'm not going to give you the stats. I've done that before. It's really futile. Um, you know, it is, it is a sin. If God says, don't fret not thyself, and you do, it's sin. And I would say we do it more. It robs, it robs you of today's blessings. It robs you of tomorrow's blessings. It robs you of yesterday's blessings. It takes the joy out of life. 
you see a vacuum cleaner on the on the rug, and it just, it just if it's working right, man, it'll get everything. If it comes upon a sock in its path, it's getting a sock. If you got a good vacuum, right? And it get and so worry takes a life out of you. It sucks life out of you. Worry about your physical health. Worrying about somebody's condition, somebody's status, your marriage, your workplace environment, your job, your parents, your children, your grandchildren. We we do not live, and, and I've given this analogy before, but if you ever wondered, and you've seen these large cargo ships and uh, just these liners in the ocean and and you and they roll out these um, chains that are huge you see them they come out of the side of the ship there's a hole in the ship and these chains will come out how many of y'all know what I'm talking about you've seen that and it's rich it's remote like nobody goes down there and pulls a chain out they just let these they couldn't grab it if they wanted to it'd sink them but they, they let these chains out and the anchors and so forth, and they tie off to things. Bar, the barges tie off to, and um, but each each chain, each thing that extends beyond the boat is in a watertight compartment. And when you and I live, we allow the worries, the anxieties of today, we allow water to seep in. We don't put them in an airtight compartment. And I'm going to show you what that airtight compartment is. But look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought of the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, tonight I want to talk to you about unburdening your heart. Unburdening your heart. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. There it talks about the staff of his shoulder. And then you see in Isaiah 9, 6, this is a wonderful Christmas verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, the YMCA in western Pennsylvania, there was a man, man, man named George McCausland, and uh, it was a difficult situation. The YMCA is losing money and, um, and staff, and McCausland worked 85 hours trying to fix it up, trying to repair trying to make a go. He couldn't sleep at night. Even when he was away from his job, he was worrying about, fretting about problems he couldn't solve. And a therapist warned him that he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Somehow he needed to let go and let God take charge of his problems. But how do you do something like that? How do you do that? 
How do you do that? The breakthrough came one day. He took a notebook and he ventured out into the forest where he lived. Now, psychobabble and psychotherapist and other therapists may tell you, okay, when you, when you worry, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put down all your worries. I want you to write them down. And they may say, I want you to put down the worst thing that could possibly happen. If this does happen, what's the worst thing that can possibly happen? And, and you need to be able to accept the worst thing that can possibly happen and move forward. And they'll give you all kinds of techniques to, uh, to, to jot these things down and, and to go back and what's the worst could happen. What, and, and the what ifs and go back and, and seal this and, that, and write this down, jot this down. And that works for a minute until you pick it back up again. Is there a way to live an unburdened life in the sense of your worries? Now he said, bear you the burdens. You're one of those burdens, so fill it off Christ. So we're supposed to bear burdens. We're supposed to bear our own burdens, he said also. In other words, there's some things that we're supposed to bear. This soft generation we live, don't want, we don't want to put up with anything. I mean, you, you get just a little toenail out of whack and you want to take hydrocodone oxycodone give me a fitting all patch I got a hangnail boy I got quiet has everybody got patches on tonight I hope not but you know we, we, want, we don't want any kind of discomfort we live in a soft and we ought to admit it we live in a soft generation but he did say Galatians Paul bear you need, there's some things you need to bear and there's some things you need to bear for other people. So there are times when we do need to bear things for people, but then there are those anxious moments, those worrisome things that, that control our day. There are people right now that are not in this building that absolutely rule your life. There's some of you right here, you can't enjoy church, you can't enjoy breakfast, you can't enjoy lunch, you can't enjoy supper, you can't enjoy Wednesday night service, you can't enjoy your sleep, you can't enjoy waking up, you can't enjoy anything. Because a situation with one person is destroying your life. You're living, but you're dead. You're breathing, but you're not alive. Because this person, it could be somebody in your family. It could be somebody not in your family. They have monopolized your life. You know why? Because you've let it. You've let it. Look back in Matthew 6, if you would. He said, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the question of the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow's not cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. He has a question. Where is your trust at with God? I'll prove it. How many of you have trained drivers in your home? There's drivers in your home that you've trained. Would you raise your hand? You're not, not saying you're proud, just you have. Would you raise your hand? All right. Okay. So can you tell me when you, how many of you, how many of you ask your, um, like my wife, my wife rode with most of my boys. I think I rode with Luke. I think they rode with, she rode with the rest of them. God bless her on one of them. And uh, she rode with them. But you know why you're over there and you got your foot through the floorboard? Like you don't have a hole, but you're making one quickly. You've done knocked every freight edge off the carpet and your right side over there. It, it's bare now. You don't have to worry about dirty floorboards. You don't have any carpet left. It's nothing to catch the dirt. You just, you just shove your foot, try to break like Flintstones, like you're going to break through over there. You know why? 
because you don't trust their driving. Right? Right. Why are you shaking and almost in convulsions over there? Because you don't trust them. Why do you close your eyes when you come to those green lights that they're supposed to yield on a left turn at? Why do you close your eyes? Because you don't trust them. You're afraid you're going to die. <laughs> and so when we, when we think about anxiety and unburdening our heart, and again, I'm talking about burdens as in things that we should not be troubled by. The first issue is a trust issue. It's not that we don't trust, really, we, we probably trust ourselves more than, than we should, but the, the issue is we do not trust God with this part of our life. Now, we can, we can say it whatever we want to say it is, but the fact is we don't trust God with this part of our life. There may be 98 parts that we trust God with. You may trust God with, with this person. You may trust God, but you're still upset. You don't trust God. It may be a decision that God made that you don't, you don't think you should have. You may have lost a loved one and you're still trying to figure out how God made a mistake. And you're worried that something... You know, and, and it's normal to go back and relive things. It's normal. And Sharon, I can't imagine. And, and Miss Karen and others. It's, it's not a day goes by that somebody's lost loved ones don't think about them, right? There's not a day goes by. But you know, there comes a time in all of our lives when we have to trust God with every part of our life. It goes to our children. There's going to be places you can't go with your children. I don't mean child. You can go wherever you want to. And let me, can I just take a time out? It's Wednesday night. We're not on live. Any doctor or whatever that tells you you can't go back with your teenager to the room back there. They got another thing coming. Let me just tell you that. Don't do that. Am I okay? Something wrong with this? Don't do that. Like, go with them. Well, they need to be, yeah, no, no, they don't. Well, they're going to have a little talk. I don't care what they're going to do. They're going to do it with me in the room. Come on now. Yeah, some of y'all didn't go. You need to go next time. Go with your grandbaby then. <laughs> um, sir, you can wait in the lobby. I said, yeah, I can. But I'm not. I'm going. I mean, you know, I don't care. Well, you just embarrassed them. Yeah. So that's an everyday occurrence, you know. Um, I don't know where. I just took a time out. And I don't even know where I was at before I took the time out, right? Trust, that's a major issue. But we have to trust God with every part of our life. Our children, as I said, you can't, God got you. I said, you can't always go where they are. There will come a lot of time in life when they will not be under your roof, potentially. And there will be decisions that they make that you're not there to help them. You can't go there. Instead of, instead of be sick at night, and there's a, there's a part of that that's going to continue with you. But let me just tell you, what's the difference in us and the world if we don't trust God with every part of our life? With our children, with our children, you know, I, I'm, I'm for being, I'm for being, I don't care. You can call it helicopter. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, drone, helicopter parent, drone parent, spy, whatever you want to call it. I believe in it. And so don't talk to me about that. But at some point there has to be a time in your life. When like Hannah, you give those children back to God because they're not yours. So unburdening your heart has to do with it. It's a trust issue. It's trusting God with the most vulnerable parts of your life. So I ask you tonight, what part don't you trust him with? 
Are you still mad because of a certain thing that happened? Are you mad because something didn't work out like it should have worked out? Or are you still uh, consumed by this, this interpersonal thing you have with somebody and that is robbing you because you don't trust God to handle that person? Do you know why some of you won't forgive? And, and, and we have a lot of unforgiveness in churches, not just this church. You know why people don't forgive? You know why? Because sometimes they don't trust God to take care of the situation. They look at it like if I turn them over to God, he's just going to let them off the hook. Oh, no. If he's going to clothe the lilies of the field, come on. He feeds the fowls of the air every day. If Bill Gates had to do that, he'd be a pauper tomorrow. And God does it every day. And to think that you, there's something that is out of, that, that God cannot handle is ludicrous. I don't care what it is. I want you to think of it right now. Put it on a, put it on a, on a napkin, an imaginary napkin. Is that this is what I'm having trouble giving God tonight. This event in my life, this, this time in my life, this person in my life, this part of my life, I'm having trouble giving God this. He said, hey, take no thought about, it don't mean don't plan. That's foolish. There's all kinds of examples where it's wise to plan. But take no thought as in, don't be consumed with things that God's already took care of. Don't be consumed with things that are in God's realm. There are things tonight that you're consumed with that of working out and figuring out that really truthfully you can't figure out. You can't work out. God's going to have to. And so the first matter of unburdening your heart is a matter of trust. Do you trust God enough to allow him to manage? Number two, there has to be a transfer. Not only the trust factor, the transfer factor. There has to be a transfer. Back to my, back to my illustration. McCausland, the YMCA, he working 85 hours a week, trying to, trying to keep the YMCA afloat. And uh, he took a notebook, he went in the forest, way out from where he lived. As he walked through the woods, he could feel himself relaxing just a bit. And he sat down under a tree and he felt at ease for a moment. For the first time in months. He took out his notebook and uh, he decided to let go of the burdens of his life. He wrote God a letter. He wrote God a letter. And here's what his letter said. Dear God. Today, I hereby resign as general manager of the universe. Love, George. He said, I resign. And then he said, looking back at that moment, and wonder of wonders, God accepted my resignation. Some of you tonight, you know you need to, you, you, you recognize that there's an area that you have failed to trust God with. If I had you raise your hand, I could raise my hand. We could all probably raise our hands. Will we agree with that? There's an area in my life that I, if I were honest, I failed to fully trust God with. Your children, your, your, I mean, again, there's, there's a difference in, in being concerned about their welfare and, and taking God's role. There's a, there's a fine line there. God's, they're his children. It was a glad day of my life when I understood he loves them more than I do. And he loves your children more than you do. Because his love's perfect. But when, when we get the trust issue settled, is that settled with you? I don't ask you, is that settled? Because before the, before the transfer has to happen, you, you've got to be able to trust. You've got to trust. For instance, before somebody writes a will and they trust one estate to another person, there has to be a matter, before there's a transfer of property, there has to be a trust in that individual to some degree. So I want to ask you, you got the issue right here. Do you trust God with that? 
There's a person you can't stand. Do you trust God to work in that person's heart? There's a situation that you cannot put your, you can't, you can't reason it. It's beyond, you don't even know why God, what happened. Can you trust God with that? There's other situations at work or in your marriage that are insurmountable. Can you trust God with that? Some of you right now are fretting about your future and, and where you're going to live and where you're going to go and what you're going to do and how you're going to get there and how you're going to do this and that and that. Can you trust God with that? Some of you may be on the, on the other end of that. And you're getting ready to retire and, and man, or you have retired and now you wake up one day and find, man, what in the world? You got more, more to do than you had before. But besides that, you're, you're, you're a nervous wreck because you, you don't know what to do with yourself. You're almost on your verge, uh, on the verge of depression because you don't know what to do. I, I sometimes I, 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 I don't think that'd be the case. How many of you retired and had more to do before you was working? Yeah, that's right. I know Larry and him, y'all work like crazy. And that people do. But there has to be a trust with God. No matter how, listen, your children are not your children. Your money's not your money. Your house is not even your house. They're all gifts from God on loan. He's the manager, not you. When you, when you get, when you leave the place of trying to take over his role and trust him, that's the start. Then there has to be the transfer. You got to be able to say, I resign and I'm going to give you It'd be like the person that, that sold a house but still kept a key to it. That's illegal, by the way. But you so, sold the house, but you didn't want to give them the key. You kept, you gave them one key, but you kept a key. Just in case. Just in case what? They bought the house. Same way with God. He purchased you with his own blood, but you won't give him the keys. He went to Calvary's cross and suffered the most excruciating death known to man. But you still refuse to give him the keys. There's a part of your heart in your life that you refuse to give him. You won't become vulnerable to him. You're afraid. It goes back to trust. You don't trust him, so you're not going to give him the keys. Why would you not give your five-year-old the keys? Obvious reasons. That's your own medication. Don't give them the keys. Because you don't trust them. Some of you have the keys to certain parts of your life. You won't give, you won't transfer. Because there has to be a transfer. Verse 30. Oh, you have little faith. Why is there no transfer? Right there. Oh, you have little faith. What stops the transfer? A lack of faith. Verse 31, he said, don't, don't worry about these things. For that's what the Gentiles seek after. Verse 32, for your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He said, I want to tell you something. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. There's a trust factor. And then there's a transfer and there has to be, there has to be a turning towards him. Seeking what? His righteousness. We're seeking a resolve to this issue, right? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We seek all the things to be added and then run to God like a checklist. We, we're done with our punches. No, he says, forget the things. You seek me first. And he said, I'll add all these things to you. Not do this punch list 
and come to me and show me that you've done it like an escape room or something. You've, you've crossed all the boxes and, and you've, you've answered all the questions and you've, you've completed all the puzzles. No, 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 no. You seek me first. How to unburden your heart. Some of you are so burdened. You're doing God's job. Maybe a trust issue. And if it is, it's, it's caused you not to be able to transfer. You cannot unburden because you don't trust. But I want you to turn tonight. I want you to turn whatever you have over to him. Turn to him. The part of your life that you're most susceptible to worrying about, turn it over to him. There's some of you who don't worry about certain things. Husbands, you know what I'm talking about. Your wife can rip the, rip the uh, side view mirror off of your car, come home and be singing Amazing Grace and not even know whatever happened, don't know what happened, don't, didn't know anything happened, just, I don't I, oh, I didn't know what, I didn't know where, I, I didn't know that. Sorry, like, well, I won't say that. Like, he, well, how'd that happen? <laughs> how'd that happen? I can tell you how it happened. <laughs> he got too close to another vehicle is probably what happened. Or tree or mailbox. But you're like, oh, oh my, no. There, there has to be, there has to be a, recon, a recognition that God, that God deserves this part of our life. Don't be like, yeah, I didn't see that. Some people just don't see because they're not looking for, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what is he going to do? He's going to add these things to you. Some of you right now, I want you to, I want you to think in your heart, will you turn these, this over to him? What you're thinking about right now? How many of you have something in mind? And this is not, this is not anything to be condescending about. I got something. How, how many of you say, pastor, I got something in mind right now. Would you just lift your hand? I don't want you to raise it anymore, but would you be willing to just say, I really want to turn this over to you. Like not come back, not hold a key in my pocket just in case. I really, because I trust you with it. Like I'm going to walk away and not even look back because I trust you with this. Father, thank you for this night. I pray you'll help us. Bless this invitation. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for what you do. There's one here tonight that said, Pastor, I'm here and I'm not sure that I'm saved. I want you to pray for me. Is there anyone like that? Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Pray for me. Anyone like that? Just say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure. Would you lift your hand? Take it back down. Lift your hand. Take it back down. Anyone like that? Anyone? Pastor, pray for me. Anyone? I, who would say, Pastor, I, there's something on my heart that I'm, I'll be honest, I've, I'm having trouble releasing it to the Lord, trusting him with it. And I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Pastor, thank you. He's going to take care of you. You know that? You don't have to go to bed tonight worried. He's going to take care of you. Let's stand together. Miss Carla's going to play. She does. If you need to come, would you just come? Let the Lord help you. Would you come? Would you come?